Good afternoon. I think I can get my title right now. So engaging a multicultural society is going to be thinking about. And we do live in a society, in a country really, where there have been many changes and uh, we're going through times of change. And the types of change we're facing in terms of cultures are somewhat different than what I think we're used to in Canada. So the truth is that if we go back in Canadian history, through, through much of Canadian history, Canada has been a majority immigrant nation. Now, there was a, a while when that wasn't the case, essentially through the baby boomer years, uh, but, uh, but we, we are seeing again many, many immigrants coming into Canada. And just in, in terms of introduction, I want to give a sense of, of what has happened in the uh, sort of immigration landscape that has made things somewhat different more recently. So we're going to think today, how do we engage with an increasingly multicultural society? How do we make sure that the gospel is clearly presented to people whose cultural backgrounds are very different from the culture that is dominant in most Atlantic Canadian congregations? And I guess, and we, this was said last night, our starting point is not great, so we've not engaged with First Nations cultures or with Francophones well in the past, here in the Maritimes. Now we have neighbors who are not only from other places, but they are not from the West. And that's really the, the big change that's taken place. And they have different religious understandings as well. Now, this is sort of a hard to understand. Let me just say here, these numbers you're going to look and say, isn't there anything more recent? Well, there is. <laughs> Stats Canada has now a, a list of statistics out on the website that, that are from the 2011 census. But it's raw data still. They have not organized it. Uh, and I didn't want to have to do that, so I didn't. So I'm giving you um, data that's not as new as what is available. So if you go on the Statistics Canada website, you will see that they have immigrant numbers that are more recent, <coughs> but they're not in charts that you'll see shortly that Stats Canada does so well on their website. But what I want to point out is the fact that there have been changes, I mean, some of them are legal changes, some of them are changes in immigration patterns, that have taken place that have changed the country of origin for many people who arrive in uh, Canada. And so the first column here, and probably it's a little too small for you at the back, but the first column here is a 40-year period, 1951 to 1991, so we're looking at 40 years. And this is only a nine-year period, 1991 to 2000. So realize that as we compare these statistics, this is four times as long as this. And this is looking at uh, immigrants who were here in 2000 and asking what percentage arrived between 1951 and 1991, and then asking how many come just in the previous nine years. And so in terms of Muslims, over 40 years, only 24% of Muslims came during those 40 years, but almost half of Muslims mm -hmm. in Canada came in just the nine years. Mm -hmm. So again, that's a, a big difference, yes. Is that saying, of all the people who came in those 40 years, 24% were Muslims? No, it's saying of all Muslims who are here, 24% of them came in these 40 years, okay. and 48% came during these. So what I'm saying is that the, the religious background of immigrants has changed quite drastically since 1991. That's when immigration law in Canada changed, or actually that's not the exact year, but, but essentially that, that period is when the immigration laws changed. So countries of origin changed quite drastically. We'll see that. I'll, I'll have a better chart here shortly to show that. Is this number just uh, applicable to the Maritimes? No, this is Canada. Across this the is Canada. Country. That's right. This is Canada. Oh. That's right. But, but it is just now you're looking back to 2001, right? The last, the last figure, 48 percent. But now, 2015. I mean, this is. That's right. So as I say, if if you go on the stats, yeah, if, if you go on the stats Canada website, you will see raw numbers up to 2011. So it is uh, somewhat closer now, and, and we'll give you a sense of what's continued to happen. But they won't be in charts for you. So again, that's just to give a sense of the way in which the religious so. Uh, let's look at Baptists. Again, so only 5% of immigrants, uh, sorry, only 5% of Baptists in Canada immigrated during these years. So again, just some of those ways of looking at how things have changed. 
Now, this is, this is a, a clearer chart, but again, it's off the Statistics Canada website, and this is up to 2006, so a little bit uh, more recent. So looking at the, the, where immigrants have originated, well, look at where, until 1981, immigrants to Canada came from. Essentially, Europe and the United States, okay? So, United Kingdom, most common place, Italy, United States, Germany, Portugal, Netherlands, seventh place is India, so finally here's a non-Western country, then Poland, and again China, but they're towards the bottom of the list here. Look at what happened in terms of top 10 countries of origin of immigrants to Canada between 1981 and 2006. China and India have moved to the top two. <coughs> Philippines, Pakistan, United States, so again, one Western country here. South Korea, then Romania, Iran, United Kingdom, Colombia. So a very big change in where immigrants are coming from. So as I said, it is true that if you go back before the Second World War, uh, the number of immigrants coming into Canada was very large. But they were Western. They were from the United States and they were from Europe almost exclusively. Uh, and even, I said before the Second World War, but even after 1991, that's pretty much the case. That has changed in a, in a major way in the past generation. Again, this is from Statistics Canada, the General Social Survey in 2010, getting a little closer. Looking at um, immigrants and worship attendance. And, um, I had a chat about this with Paul Carlin, and I don't know, and neither does he, but it's just interesting to think that across Canada, immigrants are more likely to attend worship than native Canadian, than people who are not immigrants in Canada, except in the Maritimes. <laughs> so now Paul wondered if that's because we have a larger percentage of students here in the Maritimes. I, I really don't know. It's just an interesting factor statistic. Is that Christian worship or any? any I'm presuming place? that's any. And having said that, realize that other religious groups don't necessarily um, sort of schedule worship in quite the same ways that we do as Christians mm -hmm. either. But yeah, there's nothing here that suggests it's only Christians. So when you say you know, in the Maritimes, 33, the, the 133 in the red, it means the immigrants born in? No, these, this, these are people born in Canada who say that they at least go to church once a month. Immigrants coming to Canada who live in the Maritimes, only 27% say that they worship at least once a month. To say that the rest of Canada, the numbers are reversed. Immigrants are more likely to worship regularly than people who are who are born in Canada. So when you say worship, meaning we say which church? Yes, again, I don't think that stats can define church, mosque, temple, whatever, but but those who are engaged uh, with their religious group. Yes. Okay. yes. It's across a given faith. Right, that's right, that's right. So it's not just Christian. Right. Um, Islam is the main source of arrivals from outside Canada. And this, when I tell people this, they look at me and say, well, how that be true? Because everyone's sure that the Middle East is where all Muslims come mm -hmm. from. Uh, the fact is, Islam's main source of arrivals from outside Canada by a wide margin is Pakistan, followed by Iran, Morocco, Algeria, Bangladesh, and India <coughs> since 2012. China is far and away the primary country of origin for those who say they have no religion. So, just some things to think about. We call ourselves Christians, and when we call ourselves Christians, we're often thinking about our religious faith. <coughs> to non-Westerners, the term Christian may not even refer to our religious faith. To non-Westerners, it may refer to movies, television, morality, politics, war, greed, the things those Christians do. And so we don't think that sometimes when we're talking to people of other religious backgrounds who see Christianity as meaning the West, the Western culture, and all the baggage that goes with it. Um, it, it means that we have to be sensitive in ways that perhaps we never ever thought of in terms of things like food laws and, and the ways that we dress, that, that other people may see those things as reflective of um, 
Well, certainly insensitivity at least, uh, or, or more. Uh, things with regard to language, diet, cultural understanding, those that face discrimination and prejudice or even danger. Those are things that we're seeing the reality of now with, with more refugees coming to you. And I think for us as churches, the challenge is can our love extend beyond our cultural familiarity? Can our love, can we love people whose culture is very different, very different uh, from ours? And by love, I don't mean have warm, fuzzy feelings and wish them to have a you know, good night's sleep and a nice meal. I mean, I mean engaging, I mean building relationships with them. Can we love, can our love, can our friendship, maybe is a better word, can our friendship extend beyond our cultural familiarity? Okay, Paul. Uh, Paul Carline works for CABC and CBM, yes, that's how it works. Yeah. And uh, in terms of the intercultural ministry, and uh, has been a little bit busy these days <laughs> in the midst of the refugee crisis and really giving a lot of leadership in that way. So thank you for being here today. Thank you. I'm one of those uh, UK people who came before 1981. <laughs> and we weren't Christians. And the people we bought our house off of moved next door and befriended us. And um, they actually ran a Bible camp. And I went to camp and heard about Jesus and received him into my life. My parents and siblings sort of followed some time after. So thinking about those, that, you know, the, the fact that now immigrants are coming from Muslim countries, that's less, less likely to happen. Um, it, it's going to require a, a much different approach. But the same love, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. that, that family became our family. We did vacations together. So looking back in old pictures, we didn't realize at the time, but like, my dad and their dad bought the same type of car. It's identical. They wore the same kind of hat. Yes. Yeah, but they really did become a family to us. And, uh... When I ended up pastoring in that community and was a terrible missionary, just a young pastor just wanted to keep the church happy. My life was church and uh, never gave the community a second thought. E even though it hadn't been that long before that I was in, I was the community and Christians <laughs> met us where we were at. It wasn't until going with CBM to Kenya and finding ourselves in a Muslim village, lived in a Muslim village, that we realized we weren't in Kansas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Except for not everybody here might know what CABC and CBM is. Uh -huh. just said it. Okay. So, yeah, CABC is Convention of Atlanta Baptist Churches, CBM, Canadian Baptist Ministries, and we went with them to Kenya to work with Somalis. You know, and a part of me came alive in that village. Uh, it, had, it, always, it had always been there. But I suddenly felt more alive spiritually mm. and realizing that God wants his church in the world. And, and sometimes our language talks about, okay, yeah, how, you know, because if, if, if your particular church is going to be, if it has a future, no doubt it'll be an intercultural future because that's where we're heading with, with immigration. It'll be multi-ethnic, multicultural. But, but really this, this session, this, these lectures aren't about how, how to grow church, but how the church can be a blessing mm. to God's world. And, and uh, our mentor in Kenya, he said to us when we arrived, he said, enter the chaos. That's how I put that there. <laughs> you have to enter the chaos. And, uh, and it really is going to, I mean, Steve's slide show what a, what a cultural jump immigration is presenting us with uh, for our future outreach. And it is going to be very much entering the chaos. It's my new favorite picture. <laughs> this is from our uh, Atlantic Baptist uh, Refugee Sponsorship Facebook page. This was just uh, taken last Thursday, so it's not a week old yet. A family arrived Wednesday night, last Wednesday, 
in a snowstorm <laughs> in Fredericton and drove with their sponsors <coughs> to Chipman. And um, when I drove to Chipman to do the training with Julie, I, I really wondered if this was ethical or not. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it wasn't that it was a matter of like, do to others that you wouldn't want to have done to you. I hope no one from Chipman is here. They're too busy with their new family. But, um, and, to make matters worse, the house that they want for the family wasn't ready. Oh. And so the family went to someone's cottage. And I, and my mind was, was really, I thought, you know, someone who already lives in Shipman, who has a cottage, what's, what, what could that cottage be like? And it is, it's out in the woods, and uh, somewhat by itself, and, and that's where the Syrian family landed. And the next morning, they built a snowman. Mm -hmm. And the father put his headscarf around the snowman. And I have the exact same headscarf, actually. And I have it in a box, you know, I keep my world separate. But he put his on a snowman. It's a two-way street. When we talk about going cross-culturally, um, if people are interacting with you, then they're, they're being willing to be cross-cultural as well. And, uh, it's, it's good to remember that adjustments are being made on both sides. And this is the family. And they love it. And the, and, and the father's all excited about going hunting in the fall. <laughs> it was the perfect family. <laughs> I'm going to call on Judith Todd. Actually, this is a room full of people who have been involved in sponsorship. I'm looking around. We, um, Edward Powell pastor from Grand Bay Baptist, he said, um, we, there was a ministerial meeting I was at, and um, you were there at the beginning, too, I don't know if you were there when he said this, but uh, people were just talking about how busy they were, and you know, this is all of, all of the influx of refugees into St. John, and Edward said, the word God's given me is fun. <laughs> Can't we have fun? Mm -hmm. There's snow out there. These kids have never probably seen it or been in it. Yeah. Is there a way we can bring some fun into this? And uh, I'm not sure if that's I'm not sure that's a good intro to you, Judith. <laughs> Maybe it hasn't been fun <laughs> up to now. <laughs> but um, Judith is a part of a sponsorship team right here in Wolfville. Um, they sponsored a Syrian refugee family. The family arrived last week, the week before last week. And uh, I'd just like to talk, talk a little bit about that journey. And there's a whole bunch of people who could do this, who are in this room right now. Do it. Which is a bit daunting. <laughs> <laughs> but we'd just like to, I'd, I'd like everyone to hear how it started and, 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 and what, how it, what it resulted in, what, what it meant for the group when the family actually arrived. But, but also what called them, what led up to it, and then what it was like when it actually happened. Should have given me that before I prepared my notes. <laughs> it's right. I, I am going to follow my notes because I was given a time limit, right? And some of you who know me know about notes, it could be problems. It's really good to be with you. And as I look around, I see others who could speak more fully to the topic. But Paul asked if I would say a few words about the Syrian family that's come to live in Wolfville. Every group and every church has its own story. And ours is just one snapshot in this whole uh, si process of bringing Syrian families to the Maritimes. In our case, some of the churches under the Wolfville Area Interchurch Council decided that they would work together with the community to bring a Syrian family. And we formed the um, Refugee Support Network in our group, we are Christians, and we are Muslims, and we are friends with secular views and humanitarian hearts. I think that God is pleased to see how we work together with love and compassion. And I am trusting that Jesus is honored as, and hopefully people see him 
through those of us who are Christians in the group. There are over 50 of us in this refugee support committee. It's a great blessing for us to have such a diverse group of people with so many gifts. It was wonderful to know that in this community there were that many people and more who wanted to be a part of this. And John and I, who co-chair the committee, will sometimes say to ourselves, it's a tiny bit like herding cats some days. <laughs> Our convention staff, Paul and Jacqueline and Angie, have been terrific. They are continually, if you're in the process, you know they're continually bringing new resources out. They answer questions that we've asked more than once, and they do it with great grace and patience. And of course, we know that they are praying for all of us. We have a family of six. Hussam and Aisha are parents in their 40s. Mahmoud is 18. Uh, Mayar is 17. Islam, the only girl, is 12. And Molham is 10. We are learning as we go. And by the time our second family comes, we think we're going to be pros at this. <laughs> but at this point, We've kind of defined three stages we're going through. I expect there might be more, but so far we just know these three. There's this time of preparation. And if it was care and compassion that brought us all together from our various backgrounds in the first place, the time of preparation had a lot of uncertainty and waiting. Not waiting as much as some of you have been waiting. In fact, we could have waited a touch longer. <laughs> <laughs> Those were the feelings, because you need housing, but you don't know who your family is yet, or what shape they're going to have. So we ended up with three boys and one girl. So that changes the dynamics of what kind of rooms you need. You need furnishings. We were offered cribs. Our youngest is 10. You need to talk to schools. Well, is it the elementary or the high school? Well, it's both. Of course, you need to do fundraising. And then there's the applications, which your office is wonderful at walking us through. And the night when it had all gone off to Winnipeg and I realized I had not put something at the top that I was supposed to put there, and she had seen it. Oh, I was so relieved that night when she wrote back to say, it's okay, it's gone with the right file number on. <coughs> waiting for some of you. Some of you here, put up your hands if you're still waiting for your families. Yes, yes, yes. <coughs> I think that must have its own challenges in the disappointments when you think they're about to come and then something happens that they don't, and keeping up the enthusiasm and the excitement of waiting for a family. Some of you are so ready, some of us were not. That was one of the challenges for us in having 50 people plus, because you thought some things were being done, and turned out they weren't and it turned out the family was coming nine days after the application went into Winnipeg. So we had the house, it turned out we didn't have the furnishings. So actually the beds and the mattresses were being delivered and put together the morning that the family was arriving and the crew that was making the beds were just leaving the house as the van the family was in drove up to the door. <laughs> Don't want to do it that close next time. Then the arrival. The arrival is full of excitement and joy, that, that brief moment. So you've had come together with care and compassion, and there's all that uncertainty and waiting, and then there's the day you get to hear they're coming. And Paul asked if I would share a bit of the letter that I wrote to our team when I got home last Wednesday night after the arrival. Here's some of it. Dear friends, how can I express to you the profound experience many of us had this afternoon? at the airport. The young people from Wolfville and Horton schools, we had them matched up with the four young people that were coming, <coughs> were there holding up their signs. There was a sign welcoming the whole family. Several held up a Canada flag and others a Nova Scotia flag. We all had little Canadian flags. Someone at the airport escorted them down and we were all cheering a welcome. They said later that their exhaustion melted away with the warmth of the welcome. They are a beautiful family. They have seen and experienced hard things. They have families still in Syria, and they wait day by day, wondering if they are okay. 
They are determined to show us our faith in them will bear fruit. They want to learn English and be able to work as soon as they can. You will love little Mohan. He is an energetic 10-year-old. There was a box of Lego given to him and he was upstairs playing already. Islam is beautiful, full of smiles and warmth and helping her mother serve coffee. Mayar finished his high school in Jordan, but will go back this year to Horton to get his English and make some friends, and he dreams of going to university. Mahmoud had friends in Jordan, and he wept the night they arrived in Toronto asking if they could go back home. He is um, outgoing, and he will make friends again. He watches out tenderly over his mother. When Aisha was telling me about her sister still in Syria, she wept, and Mahmoud quietly got up and got a box of Kleenex and brought it back to her. It was such fun to watch the Horton boys and the Syrian boys on the couch with phones that had Google Translate on it, so they could put it in in English, and the boys were reading it in Arabic, and I heard Taylor Swift, and that they all seemed to nod at that. <laughs> Then they, there they were, out on the balcony, taking a group selfie. It's just very touchy. Aisha is a special woman. I think her heart aches the most for what has been left behind. Hussam is so very grateful, that's the father, for the opportunity to take, and he takes every opportunity to tell us. Some Muslim men came by, I think that was a surprise to him. And when I was leaving, he said through the translator, that someday they would make it up to us. I said, no, you will pass it on to others. Mm. He listened to the translation, looked at me, and nodded. He's going to be a good Canadian. And so, friends, I'm writing, we have helped launch this family. Less than two months ago, they first heard they could come to Canada, and tonight they are sleeping in a townhouse in Wolfville. Mm. Now we help them through the waters that lie ahead. And so we've come to the third phase, the settlement. I was thinking today that it's rather like jumping into the Halifax Harbor on New Year's. You get immediately plunged into settlement. They are no longer refugees. They're now permanent residents of Canada. And it's really important for us to remember that. So there was the banking and getting the children into school. They had their tours today because we had had storm days. Getting the medical appointments and identifying the special care that some of them are going to need. Getting into English language training and eventually job training. I got to go skating with them on Saturday morning, three of the children. Mohan, he got out there. Just going like this on the ice. Down he went, back up he got. Just going like this, I thought. He's going to be a hockey player someday, and I'm going to say, I saw him the first day he was on skates. Mm -hmm. Then that night we went to the Acadia basketball game, and they called them out on the court during one of the breaks, and the crowd was so welcoming in their, um, in their applause, and they were given Acadia hoodies to wear. So in, along with the work, you get to see first things through their eyes, which is quite lovely. We listened to the advice about not setting them up in a style of living that was going to be beyond what they were going to manage the year after. Then we made a decision. We wanted them kept in Wolfville for this year. We wanted to be there for and with them. We wanted them in the schools that we knew, and Wolfville is not a cheap place to live. We got a bit of a cut on rent, but we, so, but we have decided to give them uh, an allowance, a monthly check, um, that will allow them to live here in Wolfville and pay the rent and the power um, internet because the kids need it for school. And we bought, them, we bought them a TV. Someone in the church gave them a TV um, so they can get it up with their English. You know, there was always a reason behind what we did. We didn't think it was, we know it's not what the poor people in our community have. But we have one year, maybe a bit more, we have a year that we're legally obligated to support this family and get them out on their own. And so we made choices about what we were going to do. The government funding is 
and $50 a month here. So we are making up the difference between that and the budget that we set for them and then paying for our own months. We want them to feel safe and secure. We want them to put their efforts into learning English and getting up their job training. We want them to have fun and a good experience and feel friends here in the community. And so our fundraising uh, was geared towards doing that. And we tell them, we will tell them along the way. They might not be able to stay exactly where they are. I want to close a few minutes here, probably more than I was supposed to take, with a letter that Hussam, the father, wrote, just wrote in Arabic, and it was translated, so I'm reading the translation. Dear brothers and sisters, my name is Hussam Tahina. My family and I would like to thank everyone from the Canadian delegation that came from Wolfville to the Halifax airport to welcome us, a struggling family which faced displacement due to treachery, oppression, and dictatorship in our homeland. We would like to thank the representatives of the Canadian government in the town of Wolfville, in particular, Mr. Keith Irving, as well as the support team, John and I, and everyone who has welcomed and supported my family and I, and contributed their best efforts to secure a home for us with everything that is needed in order to establish a secure and stable life here in Wolfville. In conclusion, we thank the Government of Canada who strived in helping a significant number of Syrian refugees find peace here in Canada. My family and I pledge to be loyal to this beautiful country and its beautiful people. Sincerely, Hussam and his family. And so if I were asked to say what words I would give to that settlement phase, I would say privilege and blessing for us. <laughs> to share. <laughs> Is this on? Yeah. And uh, there's a lot more stories out there. And not just um, for Syrian refugees. But there's, um, there's been a lot of uh, cross-cultural engagement going on. And, uh, and I'm sure we could uh, tell a lot of stories. I'd just like to share a verse that has meant a lot to me. It's just really stood out to me that you know, this is talking about Jews and Gentiles, those who are far away, those who are near, have been brought together. And it's by the blood of Christ. And rightly so, we emphasize the fact that it was the blood of Christ that reconciled us to God and reestablished our relationship with God. But Paul really points out to the Ephesians, as you know, Ephesians is a letter about the church, to the church, that it's also the blood of Christ that brings people together. And uh, it's the cross that we lose all of our boasts, we lose all of our pride, we lose all of our distinctions mm -hmm. at the cross. And it's the cross that has reconciled not just all things under heaven, heaven and earth under Christ, but us with one another. And it's really the theological foundation for, for cross-cultural engagement. I just have a passion. I love um, when you're talking about your team, Judith, and, and uh, just the diversity in your team. I, I, I love that concept of people coming together who naturally shouldn't be together. They have reasons not to be together, and it's a miracle that they are together. We had a neighbor in Chris Pamsis, he's dead now, but he used to organize community gatherings, and. and uh, and he would sit there after everyone had come together and say, it's a miracle, it's a miracle. <laughs> and it is. Um, we serve a, our God, he's a God of relationships. And this is where we've seen the attack, or the opposition. Um, when, when you start engaging in mission, which is bringing people together who shouldn't be together, the enemy is not happy. And there is opposition, and there's uh, a lot of the opposition comes among team members. And, uh, 
And that's always been a, a tip-off for my wife and I that, wow, there's something going on here. There's, there's spiritual warfare happening. There's some good, there's good, there's progress at stake. But that's why we, we engage cross-culturally, because the cross has made us one. And then we have this command to, to go and make disciples. I think on our online material, when we talk about refugee sponsorship, um, it's stated quite strongly that you know this is this is not about this is not you know a, a means to an end. This is this is not about getting you know church growth and getting people in your church. Or, but at the same time, we have this command that. We are, we are to make disciples. I helping Lois Mitchell here with our class at St. Stephen University on, um, what was it called again, Lois? It's <laughs> about world religions. She's engaging world religions. Yeah, excuse me. Uh, encountering, that, encountering world religions. Is that the one? Uh, the one for the Asia trip. Yeah, encountering but, world religions. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I only taught it. I don't know what it was called. No reflection on the university. <laughs> one, one of the books we looked at was Diana X, Encountering God. And uh, she has this paradigm of exclusivism, inclusivism, and pluralism. Um, as, as, as different ways that you can approach world religions. And she would say the exclusivist view is you know, we're right and everyone else is wrong. And you know, if, you, if you're going to have a hope, you better become like us. Um, inclusivism would, would honor culture. It would say, you know, God is present, God is, God's grace is there, um, there's truth there. And, 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 and our core truth is the fulfillment of everything you're aspiring towards. So you don't have to become like us, but we can help fulfill you um, to become the humans that, that God wants you to be. Uh, the pluralism view is saying God, the, graces, the grace of God not only helps people to seek him, but also to find him in all of their multifaceted forms. Diana Eck would say, um, and she has a project called the Pluralism Project. And, and this is where she's going with her book. And I was surprised how many of the students um, signed up with that. Um, and, and what a struggle it was for many of the students to, to believe that it would be good to be at all, to believe that you would have anything universal to, to pass on to anyone. Anything that was true regardless of culture. Um, or geography. And I'm, I'm sure you've encountered that, um, probably especially among the young. Um, it's just seen as a bad thing to, to make disciples, to go and make disciples. When I got thinking about that, I thought, you know, Jesus was all three. But no one has ever said exclusive things like he has said to the degree that he, he said that. Um, yet, he, yet the gospel was for all people. And that was the big debate of the New Testament church. Do people have to change their culture to, to know Christ? No, it doesn't matter who you are. Christ is for you. It was an inclusivism. And yet he valued every single person on this planet to the point of dying for them. Uh, and the argument against, against exclusivism is that it, 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 it's pride, it's power, it's, you know, it, it's oppressive, it's oppression. It's looking down on And yet you have Jesus the servant uh, serving people no matter who they are. So, And along that same line, um, I think some of you have been approached to um, the possibility, I think 
Canadian Baptist Ministries is, is hoping to take some pastors from Atlantic Canada to the Middle East Conference. It happens every year in Lebanon, in Beirut. And Mark Nakad um, at the Arab Baptist Theological <laughs> Seminary and the, and the Institute for Middle East Studies uh, came up with this spectrum. I've modified it quite a bit. Now it's a very busy slide, but and we're not going to camp out on it at all. But it has helped me to think about approaches in all of this as we're engaging cross-faith, cross-culture. Um, I've, I've been on either extremes. Fear puts us there. I've been very exclusivist and, and fighting against something and wanting to change it completely. And, and, or to being just totally syncretistic and, and blanket and dormant. They're both sort of fear responses. And, and as the relationship grows, um, we get into those some, some of that other mid-range stuff. And, and there's, latitude, there's sort of latitude there for, for moving around a bit, depending on the situation. But uh, anyway, I just saw that. I, I, I knew we wouldn't have time to really look at that. Case, so I just threw it out there. Uh, to encourage anyone who might be considering the Middle East Conference. Because this is our future, according to Steve's slide, as far as Muslims in Canada. And uh, we are going to be engaged, being to um, deal with these things. Are, we're going to need to become missiologists in our churches. Well, that's fine. Yeah. Just some thoughts on disciple making before we go to another story. <laughs> When we're told to go and make disciples of all nations, we often think about making disciples of Christians. You, know, you, you become a Christian, now we're going to disciple you. But the command is to disciple nations. Faith is supposed to be public. It's supposed to be making a difference in society. And working alongside, like, like through this group, um, doing life together, learning the way of Jesus together, Matteo Ricci was a Jesuit um, missionary to China. Um, and um, he was in Macau and the, 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 the Portuguese mission efforts. And it was all about extraction. It was all about bringing Chinese onto the mission compound and giving them a different name and baptizing them. And, and it was by ones and twos. And Matteo Ricci had this heart to leave the compound and to enter society. And he asked the question, what, what has to change in society, in Chinese society, for the gospel to flourish? And you wonder, now, the gospel has flourished. And is flourishing in China. Uh, the role that Matteo Ricci played, many would say he played a huge role in, 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 in making Christianity public um, and, and applying it to aspects of life and engaging Chinese. And he, he became an expert in the language. But uh, he, he talked this concept of instead of gardening, and by gardening he meant growing flowers, and instead, of, instead of picking flowers, shouldn't we be preparing fields? And, 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 I, and I think as we think about, you know, a lot of churches want to be, say, well, yeah, we want to have an intercultural con congregation, but, they might, but they're not necessarily involved interculturally in their, in their community. They're not attending the festivals. They're not signed up as volunteers with the multicultural organizations. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where we need to be um, if we're going to make disciples of the nations. And, um, you know, this, this has been said so many times, but it's part the distinction between, you know, not, it's not about who's in, who's out, it's what direction are we heading? We, I think we often overlook the ministry of John the Baptist and Jesus. And, um, and, and, and it's a valid ministry. The ministry of John the Baptist, putting people in Jesus' way, calling them to practical change, doing things together, like sponsoring a refugee, and, um, and, and, and looking, after, looking out for the marginalized, and the vulnerable, and the homeless doing these things together as a community, calling people to this. John had a, an amazing, he had Roman soldiers coming out to see him, and, and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and Jews and religious people. He, he really was speaking 
to, to a wide variety of people, but his message was very practical. Uh, I was on the phone as I was driving here with my wife, and she was telling me about this issue they're walking with, with um, a newcomer family in St. John's, Syrian family, uh, where child protection has had to be called in. And so now she's uh, walking with the, the elders of the mosque uh, through this situation. So what's the best way to, to deal with this? And, uh, and that's praxis. Mm. And that's, that's discipleship. In, in, in tackling these things together and applying, applying the way of Jesus to these, to these issues. So, so making disciples. Um, so we kind of downplay it on our website. <laughs> but it's, uh, but it's, it, it is really what, what it's all about. And we do need to go to do it. We do need the, um, Sam Shoemaker. Oh, I think that's coming. Here they come. That's Dan Bob. He, he was a um, Al Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, his teachings. He was a he was an Episcopal priest in the U.S. Um, but it was his teachings that that is the foundation of the Ten Step mm -hmm. program. He's considered to be the, one of the founders of, the, of Alcoholics Anonymous. But uh, he wrote a poem, I Stand by the Door. It was sort of a, um, an apologetic for his life, the reason for his life, the explanation of it. He says, you know, others can go deep into to the Christian subculture, but I'm going to stay by the door and help people in. Mm -hmm. and that, was in that was in the uh, 20th century. I think in the 21st century, you have to leave the door. Um, yes, there's still, tractional church is still working to some degree. There would still have a, quite a few people in our society that would go to church if conditions were right and if they had um, crises in their life. But increasingly, that is going to become less and less, and it's going to require going. Um, I'm going to call Gavin. We talked a lot about Syrians and newcomers, refugees. And I couldn't help as Judith was telling that story. Um, how different welcome has, was. And, and Stephen, you mentioned about how cruelly we've done with historic people groups, um, Francophones in Atlantic Canada, First Nations, and uh, Black Nova Scotia. And, and it's Black History Month, Black Heritage Month, African Heritage Month. And um, yeah, I, I, I hope you've heard stories. And, and some of them are very local stories, right in this neck of the woods. A totally different kind of welcome that we've given. And, um, and my hope is that engagement with, with newcomers who are so obviously from you know, away, and <coughs> represent a totally different culture that we have to go to will, will teach us how we need to do this for so many of our neighbors. And uh, I'd like Gavin just to share um, about how they as a church and individually, how they've been going, entering lives of, of people in their community. I probably set you up worse than I did for Judith. <laughs> because I told him I wasn't going to do it uh, when he first asked me. And, but then he said something very interesting. He said, you know, as we talk about uh, Syrian friends coming and inviting them, we've also got to then talk about the uh, cross-cultural that have always been with us. And I think we can either get in competition with or we can forget. Um, uh, but the reality is we're not in competition. Uh, the newcomers are not in competition with those who are marginalized in our community. Um, God has given us enough resources to do all of this. Um, and we should never forget. Um, we should never forget there will always be refugees. And we should never forget there will always be the poor among us. And so that's our calling. And, and I love that. Uh, I, I would encourage all of you to go and read that, that poem um, that he writes. It is an incredible poem. 
And I think the question you're going to have to ask yourself is where, where am I situated? Am I a person that still, he talks about going into the caverns of, of religiosity. And he's not putting down that. He's saying some people really need that. But it, I think it's worth a uh, point. But that's not what he asked me to talk about. <laughs> I, suppose, I suppose to share a couple of stories. And, and so I, I was sort of thinking about that. And I, yeah, I, I can talk. I think our church is a wonderful church. Um, and it's, like, it's a church that is, is learning. Um, it's a church that is learning what it means to be inviting. Um, I think what I like about our, our, our church the most is we're willing to take some risks. Um, we've made a lot of mistakes. We continue to make a lot of mistakes. But we're trying to teach each, uh, each of us uh, to, as we're discipled to what it means to go out. And maybe I'll just take, uh, tell a few stories. I was going to tell you about Food Bank. and well, I don't think I will do that. I'm going to tell you a few more personal stories that have really just touched my heart in terms of uh, people in, uh, in my church. Um, and that the word that I would use as I think about this is the word partnership. I think if, if anything I can say about our church, uh, we talk about partnership um, as we talk about going out. And partnership is very important to us because partnership says, I don't have it all. Mm -hmm. uh, I worry that as, as a church, we often go with this mentality that we have it all. And, and if that's the case, then we're not out there to make friends. I worry that we're not there to make friends. I, I worry that our titles, um, I've got a budget for Demetrius Ling Ministry, and, and do you know that, that that title for that budget is outreach? And I struggle with that because I said, why is it still outreach after being in that community for 30 plus years? Why isn't it friendship? Have, have we gone into Demetrius Lane? A community of poor, a community of black and white and, and Russian and, and you have a, just a mixed bag. And have we gone into that community with the, the, the idea that while we've been called out, we've been called out to build relationship and friendship. Would we, do we even look for, for friendship in that? Um, and so, you know, what I get delighted in is when we can partner and realize, yeah, we need to learn from a variety of people, people in the community. And so, as I think of Demetrius Lane, I want to boast about Victoria Road, uh, a, a, a church, one of our black churches, who's just kitty corner. And first, in, uh, Victoria Road has sometimes had a relationship and sometimes not, and sometimes serves that we should. And now we're doing ministry together in Demetrius Lane, in this very poor community. And we're learning together um, what it means to share. But we're not just sort of saying, what do we offer this community? <coughs> Um, in terms of what we bring in. We're sitting with people that live in that community. And we're sitting with them. And we're really, we're listening, we're sharing, we're, we're asking, we're discovering together, we're making mistakes together. We work with the police in that community. Um, and, and so it's about partnership. It's about sort of saying we do this together and we learn together. The question I have is, as I think about this, because we work with a lot of non-Christian people, police, but my question is, do I really believe that even though that person says they're not Christian, the things they are doing is so Christ-like that I have a belief that they know more about Christ intuitively, even though they don't name Christ. I believe it. I, I work with police that I believe, even though they say, I've never been to church, they're showing me Christ every day. So that, that's sort of an approach, uh, sort of things that I've really appreciated. Um, I want to tell you a little story about something that we didn't even see coming at, at for, uh, First Baptist about uh, two years ago. Um, a Brazilian a young lady from Brazil showed up at our door, um, and she was a Christian. She came in, uh, she was enjoying worship, and she came to us and said, um, is there a place where I can bring some of my friends? Because um, they're not Christian, and I just want to do a Bible study with them. And we sort of said, yeah, just come to the parlor and we'll put on a, you know, put on some food and why don't you bring them. And our thought was that she was just going to bring the other Brazilians and, and stuff like that. Well, she came in with Asians and people from all, all, all sorts. About 15 people she brought in from a variety of different backgrounds. No one speaking English that well. And then you had me standing up and trying to explain things and they had no clue what I was saying. And yet, out of the time that we had, a year that we had with them, it was such a blessing to find small ways of sharing the word together. And what I like about that story is, we can come up with that program. We don't take ownership of that program. My concern with church is, we take ownership of so much that we shouldn't. 
we don't take ownership of the times that God brings others to us. And we have this privilege of, of really not even having the language. I, I have to admit, I, I don't think I'll ever really have the language to do cross-cultural <coughs> music well. But I think God can still use that. He'll teach me how in some ways, but he'll, he'll still work through that, and he'll work through newcomers to still understand this guy that just blabs on and on and on. And it's about not taking ownership, but just appreciating what God has, has for us. Um, I want to just tell you a very quick story of football. This is a very personal story because it's a story of my boys, and it's a, a story of a, that their world isn't church as much as it is football. They spend more time on the football field, even though they're at church on Sunday. And they love football. But Malachi is just an incredible football player. And about three years ago, we were really wrestling with this, this idea that on Sundays, uh, we're at church, and there's a whole group of people that don't have an understanding of church that will never, ever make a decision to come to the church on Sunday. They, they, they won't. I can, I can change my church to make it so contemporary, I promise you. Football players will not leave their football field to come to my church. And so as I was talking to Malachi about it, we threw up the idea, so maybe we need to go and be church on the football field. And so that year, I actually used my vacation Sundays on his football Sundays. And we chose to go as family and simply hang out at the football field. And you sort of say, yeah, so okay, what happened with that? Well, here, here's what happens with that. When you choose to identify yourself as a Christian on a football field and simply be there as a parent and as a guy that play, plays football, and if you are gracious with that, here's what happens. When they decide to do, um, every year we do sort of pink ribbon to celebrate that or to identify with cancer. And uh, we asked permission that, that weekend, if we could do just a little service, it was the first time we'd ever asked to do this, could we do just a little reflection time before the football game? And invite families to come for about 20 minutes. And just pray, because we know that there are people that are dealing with cancer, and we would love just to be with you and hear your story and pray with you. And so we did that, and not a lot of families came, I think there were about four families that came. And we just sort of shared for about 10 minutes, and then uh, we did a, a quiet prayer. And I just said, no, I wouldn't mind if, if we just had a moment of silence and we were going to end with Lord's Prayer. But if someone wants to speak into this before we do that. And so after the silence, uh, one of uh, Malachi's coaches um, uh, got up and he said, I, I just need to let you know that I'm Muslim. But I came before, because my mother died of cancer. And I'm a cancer survivor. And I've so appreciated the, not only the silence, but the care and the realization that, that we can talk about healing and we can, we can do this uh, and, and pray about this. This is, this is a guy that's Muslim. This is a guy that's not of my faith. And, and it made me realize, it made Malachi realize that we are supposed to be called to be church on the football field. You know, about four weeks later, I got a call from Malachi's uh, coach. And he, he called me up and he said, Gavin, we've got, we've got an issue. One of our coaches just committed suicide. Mm -hmm. But then he went on to say, would you and Malachi come to the funeral? Because Malachi needs to be a leader for all the boys that are going to show up. You know, when we do not go, we have no opportunity to be and share Christ and bring some sense of healing you know, this, this, this is a guy, um, a little boy now, that has lost his father. He's trying to make sense of the world. And I think we have an opportunity to, yes, invite people to our church. I'm not saying don't invite. But I'm saying even more so, go. Go and hang out and just be yourself. Identify yourself with who you are as Christ followers. And I guarantee God will open doors for each one of us. God will open doors for each one of us. But I can just end with that story of suicide. I happened to go at the end of Malachi's year, and they were having a, a, a banquet, and, and parents were just excited. And I was just sitting there, and I was actually just had a, a playing uh, chess on my e-pad, and there was this gentleman that I sort of recognized. I didn't quite identify who he was, but he was sitting there. Finally, I just sort of looked over, and I said, hello, and he said, hello, and he said, are you Malachi's dad? I said, yeah, I am. And then he identified himself. This was the grandfather of the boy that lost his dad. And he said, do you mind just coming over and, and uh, sitting? And I said, sure. 
And for the next hour, he poured out his heart to me. And I didn't have words to say to him. Honestly, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say. But at the end of it, I simply said this. If ever you and your grandson want to get together with Malachi and me, we would be oh so willing to do that. That's what we have to offer if we're willing to go and, and realize that there are people that don't connect with us, um, but they're, they're, there's something there if we're willing to be in that community and, and just uh, be, be who we are. Uh, be who we are. We have so much to offer if we're just who we are. And if we can identify ourselves as, as followers of Christ, uh, we might get laughed at, and I don't think so. More so, people are going to eventually say, I think I need to go and talk to that person because mm -hmm. I have something that I need to fill a void with. So that, that's really what I wanted to share. I think I've taken way too much time, but uh, great. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I just have this uh, last slide. And it fits in with what Gavin was saying about how we love to own things <laughs> and, and, and control it, and it's our ministry. And, and uh, it struck how Jesus, well, you know, we, we, so much of our, you know, outreach talk is actually about welcome, you know, welcoming to our our event, uh, welcome to our church. And, and sometimes our welcome is, you know, welcome, come and be like us. And on our better days, it's welcome, come and change us. But um, but Jesus never really talked about welcome. He, he was always about going and sending and. You know, in Africa, we, there's a strong belief that the guests bring blessing. And, and so Jesus sent his followers out as guests. He said, go and find a home that will receive you and, and bless it. And, and, it. and it's their home. Don't even, take, don't even take what you need. You know, don't come up, don't show up with food. Let them feed you. Um, and, 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 yeah, go, in that, go that far to other programs, into the football program. It's not your program, but, but you're there in it, and, and you're bringing a blessing to, to the people there. So going small, seeds, seeds are small, and they, they, they fall into the ground and die. Oftentimes we want to be the soil, we want to be absorbing and receiving, but we were told to be the seed. Um, and I'm saying this to our sponsorship group, because sponsorship is a lot about welcome, right? And, and we're the receivers. But now I'm trying to tell our group, okay, yes, you've received, now you go small. And, because those people have a world, those people have a life. Now you have to enter, become small, and enter their world, and honor their world. Mm -hmm. and, and going smart, and I, we don't have time for this, but that's a wholly different subject. But, there's a lot of ethics around witness, witnessing well. Um, how we witness is our witness. I, I um, working with newcomers, working with refugees. These are vulnerable people who, and you're their sponsor. Mm -hmm. you, you write the check. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very much a power imbalance, and it's about restoring power to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have to be very careful. These are these are not individualistic societies. These are this is family. This is group. This is elder based. So be smart. Uh, dealing with the right people at the right level. Uh, I, I met a guy in England who was doing this. He was doing actually outreach or dialogue. He was actually doing with with Muslim youth, Christian and Muslim youth. But he was so careful to include the families, to include the parents in that. And uh, when Steve asked me to do this, he said, you might want to talk about facilities, how we can use our facilities. But we can get to that soon. <laughs> <laughs> but Brock Simmons said, at the Cheviac Bay community, he said, he just had this sense, if we can use what we have, either on-site or off-site, to facilitate community, the rest will look after itself. Mm -hmm. I, I love, you know, Emmanuel Baptist and Hammond's planes calling themselves the meeting place. Just, yeah. we, have, we, do have, we, all, we do have physical spaces, whether it's our homes or it's our churches. 
are they meeting places? Are they open to the community? Are they safe places? Can we, can we create community? Like my neighbor would say, the miracle. People coming together who shouldn't be 